Welcome to Crypto and Gaming, where we speak about tomorrow's games today. Brought to you in part by 1UpGaming.io, the metaverse of tomorrow today. Also brought to you by the Finding Genius podcast, discussing medicine, health, and bioscience on iTunes, Spotify, and all your other favorite places to download podcasts onto your favorite device. Hi, this is Josh Hale, and this is Crypto and Gaming, the podcast. We are being brought to you today by 1UP Gaming. They are bringing extra life into all of your gaming. That's both in the crypto space and in the indie game space for all to see and all to play. I'm here today with Brendan Daly. Brendan is a gentleman who works on a project that he's working on called Daily Ventures, and he's out of New York City. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you're doing? Brendan? Yeah, of course. So, I uh, uh, great to meet you, Joshua, and thanks for having me on. So, a bit about me. I'm from Ireland originally. I have a background in engineering and kind of computer programming, so I always found that interesting. I did a master's at Notre Dame in business startups and commercialization back in 2011, 2012. It was back then that I started also getting interested in crypto, so started, you know, with Coinbase, started looking at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the early ones. And then, yeah, just ever since then, just, you know, kind of fell in love with the technology, the industry, the people around us and started going from just the tokens themselves into, you know, NFTs and decentralized autonomous organizations. So those I've minted my own tokens. I've, so I've, I've played a lot around in the space a lot. And, uh, you know, daily ventures, our focus is really on some of the disruptive technology. So automation, AI, blockchain. So that's our core focus. And then that allows me to kind of play in the space. And then one of the things I'm focused on and, and spending time at at the moment is the kind of gaming NFTs and exploring that world. Um, I think it's it's really interesting. I think there's a lot, lot of opportunity there. So, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Now, are you a gamer yourself, Brendan, or is this just something that you're interested in from a you know business point of view? bit of both so i was i wouldn't say i'm a massive gamer but i would have played a lot of let's say kind of fifa and playstation or age of empires right. or championship football manager or i definitely have phases where i you know can definitely spend hours at it i wouldn't you know say i, I wouldn't qualify or call myself a gamer per se but i definitely you know enjoy playing games and, and go through phases so i think with this it's more specifically i think the one i'm probably most involved in at the moment is zed run so that's obviously where you can buy, sell, trade, breed, race, horse races on blockchain. So that for me, you know, I just really enjoy, like I'm from Ireland, obviously horse racing is kind of a big deal there. And I kind of enjoy the gambling, the analytics, the probability side of it. So I just think, you know, what's really exciting is where you can start now buying these assets where, you know, it's an NFT, yes, but then there's all of this utility, there's all of this strategy, there's, you know, it's an asset you can leverage, you know, going forward. So yeah, I think it's it's probably a bit of both. I, I think it, it's definitely the gaming side of it, the strategy, the racing, the betting. I definitely find that interesting. But from a business perspective, too, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think the value of the gaming is just going to go, you know, much higher. You know, especially like NASCAR did a, did a deal here. I think Decentraland, there's going to be a lot more, I think, integration into some of these kind of metaverses. And I just think there's a lot of opportunity there. So, yeah, I, I, I would say it's probably both. I'd say it's, it's half the gaming side I enjoy it and half I think there's a good business opportunity where when these start to take off, I think, you know, you'll have the opportunity to lend them out and, you know, potentially generate passive revenue from them or income or, you know, being able to strategically use them to potentially earn money. So, yeah, I would say it's both. I enjoy the gaming side I, and I think there's a big business opportunity. On the business side, you know, I, I talk to people about this all the time, obviously, and I'm very interested in the idea that the gaming market currently annually is has roughly $200 billion spent on it. To put that into point of view, you know, that dwarfs many other entertainment avenues and People don't realize gaming is as big as it is. And that $200 billion, by the way, is not counting China by some standards. So China, <laughs> they've got a couple people there that like to play games. So I'm guessing the market is probably actually slighter, slightly bigger than China. And that makes the whole market, you know, like ripe for something like blockchain. You know, like the idea that blockchain wants to change the world and change it in a way that's, you know, partially decentralized, right? But partially, you know, it allows to 
ownership of what we have in either gaming space or anything else, whether it's contracts or MP3s or movie files or whatever. It allows ownership where up to this point, you know, the studios have all rented a license. And as an attorney, the idea of ownership is obviously very fascinating to me. You know, it's the idea of buying a CD or a DVD back in the day and you had it on your shelf. And while when you sold it, it might, you know, be worth 25 cents. You might also have that DVD that nobody else had that's now worth 500 bucks. And so I think it's very interesting that NFTs actually, not only do they allow you to sell the thing that you own, but they also now provide provenance of where you, you know, what you bought. And that's something that has never existed outside of, you know, third party providence. And I think that's pretty cool as an attorney. You know, the overall idea of provenance is such a unique thing in blockchain where you don't need a third party to provide provenance. That's super cool. What sort of projects are you working on? Are you doing anything in the gaming space beyond the horses or is this just a a one-off or what else are you doing? Yeah, great question. I would say it's definitely not a one-off. So, you know, back to just your point about the 200 billion market, I think that's actually going to grow pretty significantly. You know, reason being, I think there's there's more models starting to be there where you can play to earn. So I think once you start having these revenue streams and you can monetize it, I think the whole gaming market is going to go much bigger than that. So I think that's a big opportunity. The second thing about ownership, I think that blockchain enables is you can have fractional ownership. So you know, you see the board eight, yeah, board eight yacht club, and some of these bigger, more popular ones where you know now you're potentially having DAOs that co-invest. You know, you can have fractional ownership in these kind of more valuable assets. So again, back to gaming, I think you know you're going to have fractional ownership. You're going to have um the ability to you know rent you know for maybe a week at a time. You pay a certain amount, get to leverage the asset, and then it goes back to the owner with the contract. So. You know, I think it's not only that kind of just ownership piece, but I think there's a few different flavors to it. The fractional ownership, the ability to own it, but lend it out and generate income. So I think that's all really interesting. And, you know, not only that, I think it also enables, it gives you, you know, you can buy and sell it, obviously, but as you hold it, it can also give you exclusive access or VIP access. So, you know, for example, one of the other NFT projects I've I've been involved in are the Playboy Rabbiters because it just had a really good brand and I just thought there's a lot of opportunity there. But for example, with that NFT, they had an exclusive, you know, after party in New York with NFT NYC. So because I had a rabbit hair, you automatically get on the white list into the party for free. So it's, I, I do think it's a really interesting space. And I love the fact that, you know, it's just so much more than, you know, owning a baseball card or owning that. There's all of this utility, there's access, there's, uh, you know, fractional ownership. You can split it, you can share it. There's so I think it's a really interesting space. And right now, I would say my main one is probably Zen Run from a gaming perspective. But I have, like, Build Space has some really good projects. So I've actually built my own NFT games where it's kind of, you know, you can, like, fight different NFTs and they have a hell point in that. So it's definitely an area I'm interested in. And it's also an area that I'm going to continue looking for opportunities because I think there are, especially ones where you can, again, kind of, you know, potentially rent out your nft and start generating passive income so I'm, i've talked yeah, so about the idea of far. rentals and nfts i've had that conversation with one of the teams i'm involved with of how cool is it going to be to be able to rent or even pay somebody to use your nft to add value to it right like how much would it be worth to have you know say your gun or your knife or whatever used by you know the biggest streamers in the world and then you know, it's all done on blockchain. So it comes back to you, to your wallet after a week and they've used it for a week. And all of a sudden it now was owned by the biggest streamers. And I think that there's a huge value there, both for the person who's buying that as a service and for, you know, example, once it's been used by the biggest streamers, now you can rent that thing out to other people too and say, yeah, this was owned by Pokimane or Ninja or whoever the streamer is, you know, like there's so many streamers out there right now that do so many things, you know, nobody can really keep track of all of them, which is kind of cool because it's, you know, people aren't doing the uh, water cooler, water cooler coffee talk anymore. They're, they're all talking about games and they're talking about streamers and they're talking about streamers that they don't know themselves. They're going, yeah, I watched this guy last night and they're going, who's that guy? 
you know? So I think it adds value in a unique new way that we've never considered before. You know, I would assume like if you like racing games, well, even think about soccer. You, you'd said you played soccer games back in the day. How cool would it be to have, you know, Messi actually play with your soccer ball that was an NFT? I think people would pay for that. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. 100%. So beyond that, I assume that you're excited about blockchain as a whole. What other type of projects that are not gaming related are things that are exciting to you that, you know, you could see being gamified? Like kind of what I'm talking about is the idea of what you're talking about is the idea of memberships. For example, like V Friends right now, same idea. You get V Friends and eventually you get to go to whatever his convention is, Gary V, on the basis of owning his NFTs. I think there's all sorts of gamification on projects that are not specifically gaming related. And I'm curious about what you're seeing there. Yeah, yeah. So so actually I can kind of something else I'm kind of messing around with and playing around with in the background. It's not exactly gaming, but it's kind of similar. So what I did do is I launched a hundred million whiskey tokens. But my plan there would be that, you know, that you could sell those for let's say a ten cent a pop. And then I have a castle in Ireland. So the plan would be, depending on how much you'd raise, you'd buy a castle, you'd set up a distillery. And then anyone that holds a certain amount of those tokens get exclusive access to the, you know, for tastings. They could get profit sharing. They could get annual distributions of whiskey. So, again, it's not exactly gaming, but, you know, back to Gary V's kind of concept, you know, fractionalized ownership, exclusive access, kind of a distribution based on holding an NFT, um, so there's an upside benefit. So yeah, just after you mentioned Gary Vee, I think that's kind of some. So again, I think back to like the fractional ownership, crowdfunding, decentralization, and democratization of venture capital investments, so early stage startup investing. I think crypto and blockchain really enables all of that. You know, it's very interesting from an American point of view, what you're talking about with fractionalized NFTs, because a lot of what we're, you know, even attorneys like me, you know, those daggone attorneys, we're always messing stuff up. As Americans, what we're seeing a lot in response to fractionalized NFTs is how many of these things are specifically securities. And, you know, that then makes it so the people that can buy these securities are accredited investors, at least initially. And then you know, then there's the question of resale, right? So let's say a, an accredited investor gets tired of a investment. Can he just put that into the open market via MetaMask or does he have to sell it to another accredited investor? And man, that makes it like, ooh, interesting. From an American point of view, you know, like pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's not the same issue as it is in the US with that idea of accredited investors. You know, I think what the idea of doing fractionalized NFTs or even doing it in a different way where a token would own the NFT and then you're owning the actual underlying token is super cool. But yeah, you know, you have these questions of securities and you're in New York, especially in New York, man. New York's a crazy area for crypto right now. They've got rules unlike anybody else. So, well, first, the crypto is launched in Ireland, so it's not in New York. So I avoid that one. The second is there are ways... So, like, the, the with the securities law, there has to be the expectation of profit in return. So, if your dividends, first of all, if it's, it has to be passive, and I think there has to be the expectation of profit. So, as long as the people that own the token get to vote on the direction of the distillery and what, you know, what casks we use or when we age it and all of that, they'd be actively involved. And then the second thing is if you're not just paying people profit or there's not the expectation of profit, but you're doing exclusive events or it's benefits or it's sample whiskey, I think there are opportunities where you can get around that securities restriction. And then I think with the new Jobs Act, there is a limit whereby you don't have to be a approved investor, whereby I think it's up to two and a half thousand a year you can invest without having to be an approved investor. So there are potentially ways where you could cap the amount that you could sell in any one go to that. So again, limiting the restrictions that you would need on the NFTs. But yes, it is that has been one of the, the complications is getting clarity around is it a security, is it not? How do you jump through the hoops to make sure, you know, if you are raising money, you're not going to get in trouble down the line. But I, I do think again, we're still very early, but I do think there will be ways I think there are ways to currently do it now, and I think there will be more ways to do it in the future once there's more clarity around the regulation and that. But yeah, I, I think there are ways around it, but it's not 
you know, amazingly clear given the current regulatory kind of setup right now. I'm obviously very interested in it. I spoke in Miami about, you know, that precisely on the idea of securities. In fact, I kind of agree with you about the idea of active versus inactive investment, you know, based on the Howey test, you know, and obviously that's not legal advice for anybody listening. I am not your attorney. If you're listening, you have not paid me. I'm not your attorney. Don't call this legal advice. But with that being said, you know, I, I do think that there's opportunity there to discuss what the Howey test has actually said. And I, I don't know that I agree with the analysis that other things added to a security make it an unsecurity. Uh, you know, I just made that word up, obviously. You know, like the idea of uh, membership benefits and stuff like that. If somebody buys something with the uh, uh, expectation of profit, even if you have membership benefits, I think it's probably still a security if it was a security in the first place. But I do think that it's interesting and it's an interesting conversation. And, you know, there is going to need to be clarification at some point in time. And frankly, right now, you know, you have the SEC battling out the XRP thing. This this is being recorded in early December. And just in case it doesn't get out there in time for people to hear what we're talking about, you know, or XRP settles before then, you know, like, and you have this question of notice, right? You know, is this thing a security and has the SEC provided you notice that what you offered was a security? So there's all sorts of questions that are going to be answered. And I think we're going to see some answers, what, maybe in 12 to what? <laughs> well, it's SEC, so it's 12 to like, 48 months, <laughs> you know, so who knows when that's going to actually happen. But, you know, I do think that there will be clarification at some point. And, you know, some of that clarification may be that, you know, the people that benefit most from blockchain are people that are not American citizens. And I find that interesting as an American citizen. But I also think that, you know, I would hate to have the entire United States left out of that conversation. It's it's a huge market and it's kind of like the idea of the petrodollar, for example. If we leave the United States out of the crypto market, are we therefore taking away the opportunity for the United States as a country to be part of the new crypto dollar, whatever that thing is? You know, we haven't really defined that yet. And right now you have a lot of legislatures still talking about the petrodollar and they're talking about petrodollar, but they're trying to do green energy. To be honest, like, I don't really, I think there's, like, the U.S. is so proud of, like, innovation and freedom and, you know, open markets and that, that if this, do, I, I I see them being a laggard. I don't think it's a case whereby, you know, it's going to take off in the world and the United States are not going to support it um, because I just think politically and just for, there's just too much interest here. Uh, even with the infrastructure bill, I think there was a lot of pushback when they started trying to, you know, add some of that reporting language there. And there's still a lot of pushback for getting that changed. So I'm not sure that the U.S. would be, you know, I don't think they're going to be left behind per se. They might be just slightly later to, you know, be as open and free as some of the rest of the world. But it does seem like, again, you look at Canada with ETFs, you look at, you know, Brazil, El Salvador, right. there's a lot of people that are definitely ahead. But I think if if it starts working there, I definitely see the U.S. being a fast follower. Um, it's surprising that they're maybe not more ahead than some of these countries, but I suppose maybe at the same time they have most to risk with, you know, the U.S. dollar maybe and, you know, this potentially competing with that. So it's complicated, but I don't see a case whereby, you know, this is all happening outside of the U.S. and the U.S. is restricting it. I think that, you know, it might get figured out, you know, in other countries and then the U.S. will adopt their version of that. I agree that it's going to get there at some point. I actually think that we will get clarification. I just don't know when. And, you know, that's the biggest issue is the idea of what that lag is from, you know, inception to when it actually occurs. Because, you know, the crypto space, unlike the United States legislature, moves pretty fast. I mean, like if you think about the idea of the uh, Olympus Ohm DAO, that thing is such an interesting project. And now how many forks of Ohm are there already out there that are rebase tokens and gamifying the idea of ownership and gamifying the idea of savings plans? You know, I know some people that started on Wonderland when it first went up and they're pretty happy with life right now. You know, they've gamified that entire theory and they've taken the taken the bank out of it so now you have two opposing forces right and that's the gamification of blockchain the 
two opposing forces being banks and blockchain. And, you know, you have this idea that banks, banks are going to push back too. They have their own lobbyists and they, they don't want to share profits with the end user. They want the end user to just blindly accept, you know, a 10th of a percent on their savings plans. And users are becoming savvy that the banks have been taking advantage. So it's, it's interesting that idea of gamification of, you know, what our assets are. People are taking ownership of what they have. And that's the whole idea of blockchain and in gaming too, the idea of ownership, right? I, I think that's so cool. As a lawyer, I'm just like, wow, people, people are grabbing their stuff. They're saying, no, this is mine and you can't take it away. So I think that's pretty cool. I do think this is an interesting opportunity for banks like on that, for example, you know, the one tenth of percent in savings, like no one's happy with that. But you look at what Coinbase are doing now with Ethereum and that, like you do think, I do think there's probably an opportunity for banks to start adding services on top and leveraging the blockchain. And again, taking a cut of, you know, some of these DeFi protocols or that, you know, providing custody and support. But, you know, I think like with Coinbase, I think you can earn 7%. They'll take a 15% cut on it and give you the rest. So again, for banks, I think they just need to start innovating. I think that, you know, yes, they'll probably push back, but I think they need to innovate and find new business models. I think there are opportunities for them to get involved in the crypto space. You know, and there's a lot of clients that probably would love to have exposure, but haven't gone in yet because, you know, maybe Coinbase or Robinhood or these decentralized exchanges, they wouldn't trust them. But, you know, if you could go to Bank of America, Wells Fargo and, you know, buy Ethereum stake it and get a guaranteed 5%, 4% return, they'd probably be very interested. So, yeah, I think that, yes, there will be conflict between banking and blockchain initially, but I think that might change. I think the banking industry just needs to find some new business models um, and new opportunities. And then once they do, I think they're going to embrace it because, you know, the banking system is broken, like closed that weekend, closed after five, you know, three, five days to settle. And then like, it's crazy, you know, uh, cross-border payment fees. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think it's just, I think they're being defensive and that's where the pushback is. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for them and I see them, you know, kind of slowly embracing it and looking for adding support services and revenue streams for themselves in the kind of medium term. Well, it's that same idea of like Google and Gmail, right? Like we, we've had this conversation many times, uh, people I know and myself of if you are not a client, then you are the product, right? And in the banking atmosphere right now, you have all these banks offering free banking services, I think a lot of people would be willing to pay the bank to be a bank if the bank was providing interest rates that are fair and beneficial to the end user. But they're currently not. They're offering free banking and, you know, they're taking all the interest on all the things they pay. Basically, there's no real value in having your money in a a checking or savings account anymore. And so people are gamifying it. They're finding ways to not let the banks win. And I find that like to be just such a fascinating aspect of what crypto and gaming can be because it's, you know, gaming the banking system is not really gaming like video games, right? It's a, you know, a thought process and, you know, all the DAOs are based off of, you know, the the idea of uh, the prisoner's dilemma, right? And so... I find all of that really pretty interesting from the aspect of how's that all going to shake out, you know, and I'm not talking about the banks. I'm talking about all these different DAOs that are trying to gamify banking and interest in your banking. I don't know how that's going to shake out. I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I don't know how it's going to shake out, but I love the fact that there's, you know, de- you know, you don't have to depend on these banks. And again, not only for earning, but I think, you know, loans and being able to like mortgages and real estate and all of this. I think, you know, the process for going through some of these and the credit checks and the background checks and all of this, I think, is crazy. So I love the fact that, you know, one, personally, that you can go and stake and, you know, earn way more than you can at some of these centralized organizations that just rob all the upside and profit. but yeah, I think, you know, more than just the staking piece, I do really think it's, you know, the fractionalization of, you know, assets. So maybe you own a, a fraction of a house or maybe you, you, you're a part owner of five different properties and can kind of split your time between different properties and you share share the asset or the collection as with a group of people. So, again, I think that the, the higher interest savings in that I think are very interesting. I love the fact that I have access to that because of crypto. 
I think banks need to start embracing that and maybe kind of looking for ways to add that as an option for people as well and maybe take a small cut of the profit and pass the rest through the customers. And then, yeah, what else excites me? I just think, you know, more and more sophistication around fractionalization, loans, um, being able to, you know, put your, you know, make your own loan terms. So if I have 15,000, let's say, in terms of Bitcoin, Ethereum or whatever, I'm willing to loan out at 5%. I can create these custom loans on my terms. So, yeah, I, I just think there's a huge opportunity there. You know, even with like non-profits in that, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to have complete visibility and traceability in terms of like where every single thing is going, where your money went, was it spent, where it's meant to, having more restrictions. So way more control around, you know, where your money goes, the impact it can have, the upside you can have, the access to loans or generating revenue streams from staking or, you know, you providing liquidity. So, yeah, I don't know where it's going to end up, but I'm excited at like all of the different opportunities and taking the power away from the banks and empowering the, the end user and giving them more of the upside and more of the the, the options and control. Well, I am sure it is going to be a, you know, knock down, drag out fight one way or another, even if it ends up going the way of, you know, the end user. But I'm sure that, you know, nobody's going to take what's happening sitting down, you know, on in either direction. The end user is so excited about finally having, you know, access to their own money and access to be able to do things with their own money that they couldn't do just a year ago. And the banks are not that excited about that. But with that being said, we're going to wrap this up because we're getting on about 30 minutes. And I like to keep this, you know, as brief for people as possible. But if you have anything that you'd like to part by saying, feel free to tell them now. If you have any projects you're working on that you want them to check out, let them know what they are. Yeah, right now I would say that just in terms of projects, I'd, I would just kind of recommend people to do keep an eye on the gaming space. I do think there's going to be a lot of excitement and new models around being able to buy NFTs and then like, you know, let other people use it, rent it out. Or I think that's going to be a really interesting space with a lot of traction in the next year or two. Um, So definitely I would just say keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh yeah, besides that, I think kind of the main project I'm in right uh, Xfinity, obviously actually Infinity is an interesting one. Zed Run is interesting. So from a gaming perspective, those are my two main ones. But uh, I would yeah keep an eye out because I think there's a lot more going to come. Um, and especially around the, anything that allows you to, to earn as part of the ownership, I, I think that's exciting. Well, Brendan, thank you so much for coming on. This has been Brendy da Brendan Daly with Daily Ventures and Josh Hale with Crypto and Gaming on the Crypto and Gaming Podcast. This has been brought to you by 1UP Gaming, who are bringing you extra life to all of your video games on your console, phone, or any playing system of your choice. Thank you so much for listening in to Crypto and Gaming, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. See you, Josh. This has been a presentation of Crypto and Gaming Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are actively looking for more people to discuss crypto and gaming with and how they relate to each other going forward. You can email me at hello at tabletop.works and we'll be in touch. We'd love to hear what you have to say regarding crypto and gaming. Thank you again for listening to Crypto and Gaming, the podcast.